What this video is, is a supplement to our ECG laboratory in Anatomy and Physiology 2 at Kirkwood Community College. This is a two-part lab, and in this lab, we initially go through the theory of ECG and how ECG picks up the electrical signals conducted through the heart. In the second part of the laboratory, we follow ECGlibrary.com's method of determining if an ECG is normal. This essentially involves going through the ECG to determine that everything is normal, that there are no abnormalities. This video is intended for pre-nursing and pre-health majors, and I want to be clear that I have no expertise in this. I'm no MD. I've never looked at an ECG that mattered. I have a background in neurophysiology that I think makes me particularly curious about ECG, but even more so, I think this is a great example for pre-nursing, pre-health students to see the cleverness and ingenuity in medical testing. Often in medical testing, there are no black and white answers. It's rare that something directly means this. There's a cleverness and an ingenuity. There's a, we've got to figure this out. We've got to see what's going on inside of this black box by using any trick, any procedure that we can to figure out what's going on. And again, the ECG is just a great example of that because you hook up some wires around the heart. It could be the, on the arms and the legs. You're going to watch this electrical tracer go across the heart. And you can figure out so much about heart function by recording this ECG. I also think it's important to try and learn ECG because it further demonstrates an important skill in health, and that is the ability to see complex processes as built up from simple rules. And ECG, if you understand the very simple rules of what the electrical conduction is, how the leads pick up that conduction, how the leads specifically see conduction differently, then ECG is not nearly as complex. In our lab, we essentially follow, as I said before, the ECG library. And I'm going to follow that format again, but I'd recommend that you go back to ecglibrary.com, www.ecglibrary.com, because they will also supplement with links to pictures of abnormal ECGs. Also, I want to credit them because I am using their material considerably. For my students, as we follow through ECG library, I like to illustrate how the various tests from science rhythm, QRS axis, P waves, PR interval, QRS complex, QT integral, ST segment, T waves can be used to peer inside of the heart. So this video will essentially run through those abnormalities and I'll try to illustrate what those abnormalities indicate about heart function. I'm going to start on a relatively simple one and that is do you have a normal sinus rhythm? Which is essentially asking what is the heart rate? When the heart rate is too fast, it's called tachycardia. Generally, tachycardia depends on your age, or how fast your heart should beat depends on your age, but in a normal adult, a resting heart rate above 100 is considered tachycardia. This can arise from a great many sources. It can come from inside the heart, outside the heart, it can come from the atria, it can come from the ventricles. I would highly recommend, if you're more interested in the details of all the different causes of tachycardia and bradycardia, that you seek other sources on the web or on textbooks. Wikipedia has a nice site, Medline Plus, Medpedia, all these are good sources to figure out what can cause tachycardia. When the heart rate is too slow, this is called bradycardia. Bradycardia occurs when the resting heart rate is below 60. And just as with tachycardia, it can come from inside the heart, outside the heart, from the atria, from the ventricles. It can be endocrine, electrolyte, neurological disorders, there's a great many things. And, the, and rather than going through each of those in this video, I'll recommend that you go out to Medpedia, Medline Plus, Wikipedia, something like that to get more information. The only thing that I would like to do is to explain really, really quickly how you can determine heart rate from ECG traces. Clearly any ECG machine will probably calculate this immediately, but it's nice also to be able to look at the trace really quickly and figure out what the heart rate is. The very, very simplest way to do this is to realize that all you need to do is divide from 300 the number of large blocks between R waves. So we have an R wave here, and it's lining up with one of our big blocks. And what I mean by big blocks is that big block. So there are one, two, three, four big blocks, roughly four blocks between this R wave and this R wave. So we, do, so we divide 300 by four, and that gives us 75 beats per minute. If there were five blocks, if this QRS was out here further, then there'd be five blocks and our heart rate would be 60. If our other QRS was right there, then we'd have one block between QRSs and our heart rate would be 300. If you'd like a more accurate estimate, if your R waves are not lining up exactly with large blocks, then you take the small blocks, the number of small blocks, 
between r waves, and you divide that number by 1500. So say that I've got 21 small blocks between r waves, then I take 1500, divide by 21, and I get something like 71 beats per minute. So the 300 divided by large blocks is a really quick estimate. The 1500 divided by small blocks is a little bit more accurate. Next up is, do you have a normal QRS complex? And again, to go back, again, you should probably watch the EKG video. But what the QRS is picking up is it's picking up depolarization of the ventricles as the current goes up the sides as well. So it's picking up depolarization of the ventricles. Without going into detail, the shape you get a tiny little Q wave, an R wave, an S, and then a T. So this is P, this is the Q, this is the R, this is the S, this is the T. So we're looking at the shape of this QRS. There's essentially two things that we're looking at. Probably the more diagnostic is the width. And the reason you care about the width is let's say that there's some damage to the inside of the heart. Again, the inside of the heart seems to be particularly susceptible because that's the last place to get blood. If this is the normal flow, now all of a sudden the current has to flow around the dead tissue or the tissue that's not functioning as well. Now the conduction system of the heart is supposed to be very fast. It's specialized AR cells to conduct electricity. As soon as you block that and you make the current go around, it slows down. So the way you will see that generally is it's going to take longer for the QRS to develop. Probably the better way to draw this is this is represented by this and it's very fast. This depolarization occurs very fast. The depolarization up the walls, again, very fast. Anytime there's a blockage, so this conduction is slow, then this might still occur relatively quickly, or it could in fact incur, occur very slowly, but the whole process then will be delayed by not being able to follow the normal conduction. The metaphor in my head is if there's an interstate that's blocked, you can still get to where you're going to need to go, you just won't get there as fast. So in this case, if you're following the interstate, you're going to get there fast. If there's a blockage of the interstate, you'll still go around, you'll use other streets to get where you're going, but it's going to take longer. Same thing here. If the interstate is blocked, the natural conduction system is blocked, the electricity will have to go around. It can also change the shapes, or in the case of what's called a bundle branch block, say that current is normal on one side, but there's dead tissue here, current has to go around on this side, you can get kind of an odd EKG. You get the normal R, and then you get this longer R. So the normal R is coming from going down the right side, and the abnormal is from having to go around that tissue. The other thing that can happen, and it's not as diagnostic, is the height. of the R wave. And again, this comes down to many other things, like how conductive the body is and things like that. But if you add lots and lots of muscle, then that would also lengthen and may even make it higher, your QRS. So that can also indicate that there's a problem if you have hypertrophy. So if your QRS is very large, that can indicate hypertrophy, excess muscle. So our next question is, do you have normal P waves? And P waves are interesting because they're an indication of what is going on in the atrium. And there's essentially two things to look at. What is the height of the P wave? And what is the length? Again, in a normal heart, the P wave is when the ECG picks up atrial depolarization 
and you see the signal from the SA node to the AV node. And again, if this is difficult to see, I'll make sure that there's a scan. You can find those in the more info tab. And where you'll see this is in the P wave, which is right here. Now the P wave can get larger, and the general indication of a larger P wave would be if there's additional muscle in an atria. So I got more voltage flowing through that additional muscle than you would expect to see a larger P wave. Now this, without going back to the ECG video too much, but essentially what the P wave, how the P wave is picked up. So this is lead one, this is lead two, this is lead three. Now the normal sum, again ECGs pick up the sum, the normal sum kind of heads in this direction. If you have additional muscle over here, it might pull this vector to be more parallel with lead one. And if it's more parallel to lead one, then lead one will pick up that voltage change greater, more. So another indication would be a larger P in lead one than lead two. So again, the normal vector is in this direction. You can pick up hypertrophies of the atria if either the vector switches this way and starts to get larger in lead 2, switches this way and starts to get larger in lead 1. Again, that's an indication of hypertrophy. The way you judge the height is you find yourself a P wave, and essentially you want it less than 2.5 blocks. So this is maybe 1 block high, so that's a good fine P wave. The other thing you're going to look at is the length of P wave. The reason we care about the length of the P wave is because if the current actually goes through the AV node as it should, there should be a tenth of a second delay. So if we see that here, there should be at least a tenth of a second between the beginning of the P wave and the Q. If there's lacking that, or the P wave is too long, it means that some of the current did not stop right here, but passed down into the ventricle. And that's going to make the P wave really long. Something called Wolf, Parkinson, White's. This is a classic example. Again, rather than stopping right here, the P wave continues on to the ventricle, and that stretches out the P wave, indicating it didn't stop at the intrusory wall because the P wave was bigger on. The way we measure that over here is we simply find the P wave and we look at the length. In an EKG, each small little box, small box, equals 0 0.04 seconds. So if I'm just one block wide, then my P wave is only 0 0.04 seconds in length. You would like the width to be less than 0.11 seconds. So essentially you need your P wave to be slightly less than three blocks. Less than three small blocks. And that's is a width that's appropriate. Next up is do you have a normal QRS complex? And again, to go back, again, you should probably watch the EKG video. But what the QRS is picking up is it's picking up depolarization of the ventricles as the current goes up the sides as well. So it's picking up depolarization of the ventricles. Without going into detail, the shape 
should get a tiny little Q wave, an R wave, an S, and then a T. So this is P, this is the Q, this is the R, this is the S, this is the T. So we're looking at the shape of this QRS. There's essentially two things that we're looking at. Probably the more diagnostic is the width. And the reason you care about the width is let's say that there's some damage to the inside of the heart. Again, the inside of the heart seems to be particularly susceptible because that's the last place to get blood. If this is the normal flow, now all of a sudden the current has to flow around the dead tissue or the tissue that's not functioning as well. Now the conduction system of the heart is supposed to be very fast. It's specialized AR cells to conduct electricity. As soon as you block that and you make the current go around, it slows down. So the way you will see that generally is it's going to take longer for the QRS to develop. Probably the better way to draw this is this is represented by this and it's very fast. This depolarization occurs very fast. The depolarization up the walls, again, very fast. Anytime there's a blockage, so this conduction is slow, then this might still occur relatively quickly or it could in fact incur, occur very slowly, but the whole process then will be delayed by not being able to follow the normal conduction. The metaphor in my head is if there's an interstate that's blocked, you can still get to where you're going to need to go, you just won't get there as fast. So in this case, if you're following the interstate, you're going to get there fast. If there's a blockage of the interstate, you'll still go around, you'll use other streets to get where you're going, but it's going to take longer. Same thing here. If the interstate is blocked, the natural conduction system is blocked, the electricity will have to go around. It can also change the shapes, or in the case of what's called a bundle branch block, say that current is normal on one side, but there's dead tissue here, current has to go around on this side, you can get kind of an odd EKG. You get the normal R, and then you get this longer R. So the normal R is coming from going down the right side, and the abnormal is from having to go around that tissue. The other thing that can happen, and it's not as diagnostic, is the height of the R wave. And again, this comes down to many other things, like how conductive the body is and things like that. But if you add lots and lots of muscle, then that would also lengthen and may even make it higher, your QRS. So that can also indicate that there's a problem if you have hypertrophy. So if your QRS is very large, that can indicate hypertrophy, excess muscle. Our next question is, do you have a normal QT interval? And now things are going to get a little more complex. Things are a little bit more difficult. When we're looking at QT interval, what we're looking at is this is the B wave, this is the Q, the R, the S, and the T. And what we care about is this interval. And the reason we care about this is it gives an indication of the likelihood of going into cardiac arrest. In a normal situation, if we were to draw an EKG, what that is doing is picking up cardiac action potentials, cardiac muscle action potentials in the ventricles. So if we draw one of these, the QRS, which is right here, represents depolarization. The muscle stays depolarized, and the T wave indicates repolarization. So QRS and the T. The QRS is depolarization, which I'll shorten to depol, and the T wave represents repolarization. If we're actually to draw how these cells align themselves in the heart, cardiac cells are branched, but they're also cylindrical, and they line up in little rectangles, which I'll try and replicate here. So here's one cardiac muscle cell, here's another cardiac muscle cell. 
The way this works is this one sends out an action potential and has calcium and potassium. If you're not recognize these, recognizing these, you might want to watch the video on cardiac action potentials. But during the plateau, calcium and potassium is entering the cell. So calcium is coming in and potassium is coming in. That calcium and that potassium will flow from cell to cell, causing action potentials. The reason that is is it allows the current to flow out to cell to cell so the heart muscle contracts as a sensation. Now one of the questions you may have is how then do you prevent calcium from coming into this cell and activating this cell? So the normal flow would be up the ventricles. How do you prevent this from going backwards? And the way you prevent this from going backwards is you have what's called a refractory period. Let me draw that larger. So in a normal action potential, Sodium channels are activated, calcium and potassium channels are activated, the calcium channels close, potassium leaves the cell and it repolarizes. There's also a time here when these cells are in what's called refraction, or they're in a refractory period. It's kind of a timeout. And what that means is when this cell is done and it's activated this cell, it goes into a bit of a timeout. So that the ions flowing into this cell will not go backwards and activate this cell. So that refractory period is really, really important. It makes sure that voltage travels through the heart in one direction. It doesn't travel backwards. And that, in turn, ensures that the signal eventually is always going to come from the SA node. The signal will always come from the SA node. Now, one thing that can happen in long QT is there's a long duration between the Q and the T. Specifically what is happening is if we had a cell, the way that we have this repolarization occur is potassium leaves the cell. And when potassium leaves the cell, it takes its positive charge with it. That makes the inside of the cell more negative. Let's say that we have a buildup of potassium on the outside. Now when it comes time for the potassium to leave the cell, it's going to do this very slowly. And that's going to extend out this time between depolarization and repolarization. It's going to take longer to repolarize the cell if there's extra potassium on it. Now what that means, if we come back over here, So we're lining up these cardiac cells again. Let's say this one has good access to blood, does not have too much potassium. But this cell, for some reason, is staying activated for a very, very long time. What can happen then is this cell will come out of its refractory period while this cell is still activated. So at that point, calcium can enter this cell and reactivate it without that signal coming down from the SA node. What that means then is now this cell will become a pacemaker. And you don't want that because this pacemaker potentially then will be one of these muscle cells. It takes over, if it takes over pacemaker function, then the electricity is going to start flowing through the heart in this direction. So the problem with the long QT, it arises when usually when there's too much potassium, there's something wrong, so that repolarization is really slow. If repolarization is really slow, then some cells will still be activated as neighboring cells are coming out of that refractory period. So these cells will then activate those cells as they come out of the refractory period. That's the problem with the long QT, is a long QT can quickly descend into an altered pacemaker, or something that's called an ectopic pacemaker. Now it's kind of complex how you calculate your QT level. And the reason it's complex is because when you look at the QT interval, it will shorten with heart rate. So you need to compare your QT to your RR. Anytime that you want something in seconds, 
all you do is you multiply the number of small blocks by 0 0.04 seconds. So the first thing we want is the QT interval. So here's my Q, and here's my T. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 blocks. So that's 0 0.24 seconds. I need my RR too. So my RR is 5, 10, 15, 20 blocks roughly. But that is 0 0.8 seconds. I need to take the square root of that. And divide that then from the 0 0.24 seconds. The square root of 0 0.08 is 0 0.89. Point two four divided by point eight nine is around point point three. The thing that you want is you don't want it to be too long. You don't want it to be much greater than point four four two because then you're extending out too far. Too short is not so bad. Let's do that again real quick because I think I did that kind of quickly. The first thing you need is your QT. You get your QT by lining up your Q and your T. You multiply the number of small blocks by 0 0.04. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So in this case, I take 7 times 0 0.04, and that gives me 0 0.28. I then need my RR, which I'm going to say is 5, 10, 15, 16, 17. 17 times 0 0.04. 0 0.68. So this then is my QT, and this is my RR. According to the equation, I need to take the square root of that RR, and that's 0 0.82. I now need to take my 0 0.28. Divide that by 0.82, and I get 0 0.34. So I'm less than my 0 0.42, so my QT interval is fine. The next thing we'll look at is ST segments, and we're going to look at them together. We're going to look at the ST segment, and we're going to look at normal T waves. And this discussion is going to be pretty similar to what we just did. It's because when you're looking at T waves, you're looking at ventricular repolarization. So if this is my EKG, we care about this ST because it tells us, again, just trying to line up, that's ventricular depolarization and ventricular repolarization. So this is depolar, and that equals the QRS, and this is repolar, and that equals the T wave. The reason we care about repolarization is essentially this part drawn at the 10 cell, a model cell. This part, repolarization, occurs when potassium channels open in cardiac cells and potassium leaves. So in a normal cell, this right here is potassium leaving. If there's a high potassium around, on the outside of the cell, when it comes time for that potassium to leave, it doesn't want to leave because there's not a good diffusion gradient. It says to itself, I'm anthropomorphizing, but it says to itself, potassium doesn't want to leave now. I don't want to leave. There's already potassium out there. And so what will happen is the action potential will take longer to repolarize. There's a delay in repolarization. The question then becomes, well, how do you get this excess potassium? The way you get this excess potassium is in a normal heart, you're full of all these cells that are trying to get rid of potassium. But you have a constant, metaphorically here, 
you have a constant blood flow to help keep things everything everything in balance. So when potassium leaks out, there's a pathway to rebalance it because there's always fresh blood coming in to rebalance the concentration of potassium. Now let's say, again we'll draw that cell and we'll say there's an interruption in blood flow. There's an occlusion. In this case, the potassium leaks out. Normally, the blood would keep that potassium level, but the blood flow is blocked. So potassium builds up and builds up and builds up. And again, up here, if there's a buildup of potassium, when it comes time to repolarize the cell, this potassium does not want to leave. And it, and it extends out the muscle energy potential. Now, it's not really easy to predict what's going to happen out here when we change repolarization, but we know something is going to change. You can get an inverted T wave. You can get a depressed T wave. Those are very similar. But if we're looking at lead 2 and the T wave is upside down, that's a problem. Probably could have drawn that a little bit better. So if the T wave is upside down. You can also get an elevated T wave. Again, there's not a good prediction about what's going to happen. Are you going to get an inverted T, are you going to get a depressed T, an elevated T? The bottom line is, if, if you're having a normal ECG, then you get on a treadmill, or you exert yourself, and something happens to the T wave, the T wave changes. It means there's a change in repolarization, and that's likely due to a change in the potassium concentration of the cell. It's likely due to a lack of blood flow. Blood is not flowing, keeping potassium balance, that's affecting repolarization, and that's affecting this part of the ST. It's affecting the ST because that's repolarization. If you'd like further explanation on this, there's another video that's called Stress Testing that goes into more detail. It shows that lack of blood flow causes a potassium imbalance. That potassium imbalance extends out the muscle action potential, and that extension on the muscle action potential changes the T waves. And that's essentially what they're looking for when they do stress testing. Thank you for watching these videos. I hope they're helpful.